Bonjour les gens qui nous suivent en français. Hi euh, Donc si vous voulez poser des questions à notre invité, vous utilisez le hashtag LVVT. Et bonjour Florence. Bonjour Jean-Marc. Donc là, euh, bah je te laisse euh, introduire notre, notre invité qui est... En français, est... en anglais En français un petit peu, puis après on, peut, on commence l'interview. Sorry, Ariel, we, we begin in French, actually. Oh, it's okay. <rire> euh, donc, Ariel Valman est une jeune américaine qui est passée par la NASA en tant que hackeuse. En fait, elle a juste envoyé un email en disant est-ce que je pourrais aider à la NASA, etc. La NASA a dit oui. Donc, elle a travaillé pendant quelques années à la NASA. Et euh, ensuite, elle s'est rendue compte qu'elle euh, n'avait pas besoin de la NASA pour euh, participer à l'exploration spatiale. Elle a donc quitté la NASA et fondé euh, SpaceHack.org et différents, euh, différentes choses autour d'Internet, de, des nouvelles technologies et de l'exploration spatiale. Ça ouais. On y va Je te laisse poser les premières questions. Euh, D'accord. <rire> bah, oui, oui, bien sûr. Uh, so, Ariel, uh, thank you to be here. Uh, um, uh, could you tell us who you are and uh, what is your story? Uh, yeah, so I'm Ariel Waldman and I'm the founder of spacehack.org, which is a directory of ways to participate in space exploration. I also am the global instigator of Science Hack Day, which is an event where uh, scientists, designers, developers, and all different types of people get into the same physical space to see what they can rapidly prototype with science in 24 consecutive hours. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I, I work on these projects, and, and my uh, story really in getting involved with space exploration is that I, um, I, I don't have a background in science whatsoever, and, and I actually randomly, very uh, almost serendipitously, uh, stumbled into a job at NASA a few years ago, and it completely changed my life and made me realize how people without formal science backgrounds can really actively contribute to uh, scientific discovery and space exploration in a, in a meaningful way. And how did you get this job at NASA? Because you were uh, a graphic designer at first. Yeah, I, I started as a graphic designer I, uh, in 2008, I was watching this documentary called When We Left Earth, and it was this great documentary about the Apollo missions and NASA coming together in the 1950s and 1960s, and I really found it so inspiring that I decided to send someone at NASA an email saying that I was essentially a huge fan of what they were doing, and if they ever needed a volunteer or something, that I was around. Um, and I it never worked. Really... Huh? And it worked. Yeah, and it And it worked, and uh, I, I serendipitously got a job at NASA based off of that email, um, and I had never really in my life ever expected to work at NASA, so it was completely a, a, uh, a different uh, path in my life that opened up. What was your work at NASA, uh, at the lab? Um, my work at NASA was working at uh, CoLab, which was a program that really sought to facilitate collaboration between people inside NASA and people outside NASA. So getting amateur astronomers to collaborate with astronomers at NASA or getting different NASA missions to open up their data. Um, really just about getting different types of people to collaborate. And so NASA had specifically wanted someone who didn't already work at NASA to really come into the program and help uh, bridge these gaps. And you left NASA, but why? Why did you leave NASA? Um, I left NASA because our the collab program unfortunately ran out of funding, and so it was a a fairly um, you know sad thing. But it really changed my life, even though I was there for such a short time. It, it really did, and and so I spent the next two weeks after I left NASA creating SpaceHack.org. Yeah, because what you've discovered at NASA is that you don't need to be uh, inside the NASA. You don't have to be an astronaut to participate in space exploration. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, I think there's so many ways in which people outside of science can actively uh, make space exploration better and actually contribute in meaningful ways <clears throat> by having different people with different types of backgrounds, um, being able to do things um, that otherwise might not come about. And uh, uh, what are these these ways to to um to um, participate in space exploration without being at NASA or to, to be an astronaut or even a scientist or an engineer. Uh, um, how people like me or Jean-Marc or, or you can participate to space exploration? Yeah, there's 
so many ways to participate. It's really exciting. There are projects where you can discover new galaxies that maybe no one has discovered before, um, or new exoplanets, which are just um, in, planets around other stars. In Planet uh, Hunters? Also, uh, yeah, Planet Hunters, which is just a great project. Um, you've also got projects where you can build uh, maybe the next generation of Mars rovers um, that NASA might consider using. Um, there's, and uh, there's a competition right now that's really exciting, the uh, Google Lunar X Prize, where people around the world are trying to build and send robots to the moon within the next few years, which is just going to be so exciting. Okay, um, so uh, you, you created you created spaceact.org and the Science Act Day, but what, what is your goal, y yourself? Personally, I think my goal is just getting other people to really realize that science is just another material that they can manipulate and play with and that there's really not a barrier to entry. I think a lot of people think that if you don't know a lot about science, then you can't really play with it. Um, but I think actually that the opposite is true. I think by having um, different experiences and different backgrounds, you might actually be bringing a new perspective to science that has never been seen before. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's really about having disruptive accessibility to science. So really not just opening it up, but um, allowing for a lot of different people to actually interact with it and play with it and manipulate it um, and not necessarily having a, a barrier where you know you need to have a PhD in order to actually um, think about science in different ways. Okay, I, I read uh, that uh, you, you said that most of the projects of these events won't be useful to anything. So why, why are you working on these events? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think a lot of it's just, a, it, it is about uh, lowering that, that barrier. So I think it's really just around experimenting and not knowing where it's going to go. Okay. Um, one, what, one, of, one of my favorite stories from Science Hack Day was someone actually creating um, a device that they wanted to uh, have tell them when they needed to shave, like when they needed to shave their beard. And I thought it was completely silly, and I wasn't quite sure what it had to do with science. But sitting in the audience and seeing this sort of beard detector device that someone had created, they actually, this particle physicist actually thought that this was actually a genius way to detect cosmic rays in a cloud chamber. Um, and so actually, after Science Hack Day, they had this particle physicist wrote up this entire proposal for how to detect cosmic rays in a cloud chamber using the original code and open computer vision library someone was using to detect if needed to shave or not. Um, so that's really just what I love about it is, is by not necessarily caring where it's going and just playing with things, um, you can actually get some pretty interesting collisions that are really meaningful. Okay, and uh, you, you talked about open, open computers and so on. Uh, do you think that open data and, uh, and, so, and open computers and uh, Open files are the future of space exploration? I think they're half of the future of, of space exploration. I think opening everything up is really the first step that's needed. And you are seeing a lot of people opening up their data. NASA is really great about opening up a lot of their data um, to the public. I think that's the first step. The second step is really in making that data accessible. So with Planet Hunters, that mm -hmm. lets you uh, detect new planets. All of that data was open, but it wasn't until someone actually designed an interface around it that I really made it accessible for hundreds of thousands of people to try and be detecting planets with it. So opening it up is, is the first step, but making it accessible, I think, really is the future. Okay. Um, space exploration began with the Cold War. Uh, now it's a collaboration between countries and agencies. Uh, do you think that the future of space exploration will be a collaboration between citizens and agencies? or only agencies? Yeah, I think it, it, I think you're starting to see a lot of signals where people are collaborating. And I think government agencies are slowly but surely beginning to be aware of how much they need to collaborate, not just only with different countries, but also uh, with the private sector and with the civilian sector, um, needing to actually really open it up for anyone to be able to participate in. And I think the thing that's really exciting is seeing these signals of different companies that have been forming over the last uh, decade or two um, to do space exploration, <clears throat> and they don't necessarily work for government agencies, so it's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, you, you're, you're a member of the National Academy of Science? Uh, I'm a, a member of a committee. Oh, yes. Uh, of, yes of for uh, for human, sp uh, human flight. 
Is that human right? Space flight, yeah. Human space flight, yeah. Um, can hacking can be uh, useful to space exploration? Uh, for uh, um, sorry, hacking can be useful to space exploration from the ground. But do, do you think that it can help human flights? Because it, it's another thing. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, yes, I, uh, sorry for my English. Um, hacking can be useful to space exploration from the ground, but do you, do you think that it can help human flights as well? Um, uh, as far as collaboration goes? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm unable to actually comment on the committee itself of human spaceflight because they're currently still in session. Um, but I do think you're starting to see uh, different instances of people collaborating. You're starting to see um, things like the Austrian Space Forum, which is really collaborating across so many disciplines and, and really working towards um, uh, having more people involved in space exploration and, and also space exploration that involves human spaceflight. So I think it's really interesting to pay attention to all the things that are happening now and, and uh, kind of think about where, where they might go. So uh, do you think that a, a, a hacker will be the next man or woman in space? <laughs> uh, I, it would be exciting to see that. I, I, uh, I, I think they, uh, a hacker in, in uh, being sent into space might actually be able to accomplish quite a lot, I would think. So it, it would be interesting to see. But do you think that the NASA or other agencies have understood the, the, the value of uh, the, the, this hacking culture? I think watching NASA have the uh, Space Apps Challenge around the world really shows their embracing um, of hacker culture, which is really exciting. Uh, we also have the White House uh, doing a Civic Hack Day in June, I believe. Uh, and so you're seeing uh, the government really embrace hacking, which is just really exciting because I think it stands as a model for other countries that are maybe less sure about hacking and hacker culture, that this is something that can actually produce a lot of good in the world. Yeah, because in France, the only thing that is proposed to people is that it's building rockets and launch some rockets, but there's no such participation on open stuff. I had another question is that when did you discover that the first people who uh, were working on, um, on space exploration were people from 26 years old that, were, that didn't know exactly what they were doing. They were, they were experimenting things. Yeah, I, I think I discovered this uh, when I was watching this When We Left Earth uh, documentary on the Discovery Channel. And yeah, it was, it was talking about how people at NASA in the 1960s or so, the average age was about 26. Um, the average age last time I checked uh, at NASA, which was probably a few years ago, was around 49. So it's really changed quite a bit, um, and it's matured. And there's positive things that come out of an agency maturing, but also, you know, there's more negative things like becoming more of a bureaucracy. And so really looking back at the 1950s and 1960s of NASA and seeing that it was a bunch of 20-somethings who were figuring out how to go into space, and no one knew how to go into space yet, um, it was just really actually quite empowering because I felt that I didn't really know much about space either and, and I could see that um, clearly NASA started out with a bunch of people who weren't necessarily yet rocket scientists so it, it really felt like I could be empowered to, to work in space exploration as well. Because what is quite funny is that at the same time the people who were inventing what is called now the internet, it was called ARPANET, was also 20-something guys who were hippies taking LSD and who were building the, the roots of, of the internet at the same time, in the same years. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's really interesting to see the, the divergent paths and, and the internet becoming something that everyone can participate in. And yet space exploration has been very slow to the game. Uh, only a little more than 500 people have ever been in space and so it's, uh, it's really been a, um, an interesting last 40 or 50 years to, to watch what becomes more accessible and what is still very closed. But now um, it, it's a person from the web industry who, uh, who founded uh, SpaceX, uh, who um, goes to the ISS. So, so uh, is, the, is, the, is the internet, uh, is, is space a, a new frontier? after the internet? Uh, I, I hope so. I, I think space exploration is 
slowly but surely becoming more accessible. I, I think uh, with looking at um, different people, whether it be Elon Musk or Paul Allen or, or all different types of people uh, coming sort of from the tech industry who mm -hmm. are then um, investing in space exploration, it's really exciting. And I think, um, I think what you're seeing is that it's not just government agencies, but you're also seeing people who have a lot of money yeah. uh, being able to explore space. So it's, it's a very small step towards making it more accessible when, when it uh, is not just government agencies. Um, I think the next step is obviously lowering the financial barrier, and I think um, that's something that has been happening fairly, fairly slowly, but I think you're starting to see people realize that NASA should no longer have a monopoly on space exploration. Uh, but we interviewed uh, last week uh, the person from the French uh, space agency who told us that uh, it, it would it will always cost the same amount of money because the law of physics won't change. So what, what do you think about that? Well, there's some different factors that play into money. Um, having reusable spacecrafts and reusable rockets is something that actually lowers the, the cost quite a yeah. bit. So um, you, d you can't change the law of physics. You still need a rocket. It's still going to be expensive. But you can change uh, the economics around it. You can make things reusable, so that brings down the cost. And then uh, you can also, uh, if, I would argue that if you're having more people participate in space exploration, the cost is actually going to be lower. So you see this with the airline industry. You have tons of people flying around the world often, and so things that would otherwise be extremely expensive and hard to justify um, become more accessible because the companies can actually justify these large costs because you have so many people participating in it. But I, I, I personally, I want to go to space, but I, I just can't because there is no technologies for, for it. I, if I don't have money now, I, I, I just can't go. Right, yeah, so that's the, that's the sad bit. I think what's exciting, though, is um, I think the cost of cube satellites, which are, you know, these small satellites, are the cost of those are slowly but surely coming down, and a lot of people are thinking about having those be something where you could actually envision a day where you would have a personal satellite. So being sent into space yourself is something that, yeah, is still pretty expensive, and I think only time will tell to see if that cost gets lowered or not. Um, but I do think satellites are probably going to become more accessible um, over the next decade or so. So maybe you can't go into space, but you can actually send something of your own up there. Okay. Uh, have, you, have you heard of Mars One? Yes. Uh, what do you think about it? Do you think it's credible? It's uh, possible? Uh, I think it's interesting to see what they're aiming to do. So the whole aim of, of Mars One is to send people on a, I believe, a one-way trip uh, yeah. to Mars, and uh, you might be there for several decades before they could even consider getting you back. Um, I, I think what they aim to do is uh, is really open up space exploration. Um, but I have seen a lot of, you know, a lot of people who are unsure about taking a one-way trip. So I, I don't know. It's it's. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think their their aims are definitely pretty extreme, uh, so it, it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, and, and it's it's um, organized by people who are not professionals of space exploration, so it's it's like hackers. Right. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, getting you're starting to see all these different companies form who are mm -hmm. not yeah. Uh, PhDs or uh, or they're not rocket scientists and so I think that's um, really interesting to see just all these little signals and I think what will be most interesting to pay attention to in the next decade is if that number increases a lot um, so if more people feel like they can do space exploration companies um, so it's, it's definitely an exciting time for space exploration. And do you have concrete examples for people to know how they can uh, participate in space exploration, even if they ha don't have any ba scientific background it's, and so on? Yeah, so I, I've documented uh, a lot of ways on spacehack.org, and it, it really is just this directory of all these different ways in which people could participate in space exploration. Um, sometimes these things involve uh, analyzing materials from Antarctica or um, microbial lakes um, in Canada. Um, some uh, projects want you to participate in the Large Hadron Collider, so actually 
<coughs> helping the efforts of, of really studying our universe and, and what makes up our universe. And so I think there's just all these different ways in which you don't actually need to have an academic background in order to really make contributions, um, either small or very large. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't have to, you, you just have to, to make things or to, 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 to see to the data to, to, to participate. Really, I, yeah, I, I think it's just about um, being able to analyze data or being able to actually um, bring your unique perspective to things. I, I think a lot of it is not only um, making these small contributions, but also making connections and collaborating with scientists. So it's not necessarily about hackers doing things on their own without collaborating and, and doing it instead of scientists, but it's really about creating collaboration between the science community and uh, people outside of the science community to really bring about unique, clever ideas that might not otherwise exist. Uh, will there be a Science Hack Day in France? So I've heard of someone, uh, I think in, is it uh, Bordeaux? Uh, Bordeaux. It's, it's, yeah, they're uh, planning on trying to uh, come up with a Science Hack Day. Um, so that would be really exciting to see if that happens. Um, Paris, I think uh, some people have been interested in having a science hack day in Paris, but I don't think anyone's taken the lead on, on uh, finding a venue and organizing it. Um, so I think maybe within the next year there might be people uh, doing science hack days in France. Um, and it, Science Hack Day is open for anyone to organize, so uh, literally anyone can just say yeah, that you, they organize one and, and they can do one. Okay, I, I, I want a, to do it. I, you put a how-to <laughs> on, on the website. But, uh, yes. So y you will do it? Yes, I will. Okay, she will do it. <laughs> so um, how do you, uh, could you explain why is it such an American uh, phenomenon, this uh, Science Hack Day, the Space App Challenge? Do you know why it's more in the United States than uh, elsewhere? Is it because of the internet culture, the hacking culture, or because of the space exploration the, the, the NASA do? Uh, well, I mean, you do have an interesting mashup in, in the United States of uh, it being the home of, of NASA and then also Silicon Valley. So you do have a lot of companies who have a history. Uh, but I would argue it's not inherently an American thing. I think you are seeing uh, Berlin, for instance, is known to have a really great hacker culture. And so I don't think it's intrinsically American. I think America just happens to be a very large country. And so you get to hear about more things. But I think you equally hear interesting things coming out of um, Berlin and uh, China as well. Uh, China and Shenzhen, they have an interesting hacker culture developing there. And so I think you're starting to see these little hubs around the world of uh, people who are really hacking and also interested in space exploration. Um, I would argue, you know, Europe often, from my uh, experience, people I meet in Europe are actually more excited about space exploration than in America. I think Americans have a um, poor tendency to take space exploration for granted sometimes. And so, so I think um, this mashup of combining hacking and space exploration you're really seeing all around the world, uh, which is really exciting because it will be exciting to see if there will be any power shifts and in, in who's more involved in space exploration now that it's become more accessible to, to everyone. Another point that was interesting when I read what you wrote is that you wrote that doing something changes how you see it and the, the importance of doing it, of doing things and not only yeah. watching or uh, reading papers. Do you have yeah, example? I, well, I, I would say I'm an example because I, you know, I really, prior to working at NASA, I really only watched doc science documentaries and I thought they were fascinating. And um, I think there's a difference between consuming a lot and actually you know, trying to actually do something in an area, even if you know nothing about it. I think it really does change your perspective of it. I think. I think consuming a lot of information and reading a lot of papers is, is great, but I think by actually throwing your hat into the ring and, and you know, if, if you're interested in electronics, actually trying to do things with uh, Arduino and microcontrollers, um, I, I think actually doing that really changes your perspective and it changes your relationship with it. So it really changes you from an observer to an actual contributor. Um, and I think 
that way you kind of have a, more of a vested interest in what you're doing. And so by playing around with scientific data or playing around with space exploration, um, I, I think you feel a lot more empowered than you would if you were just um, only reading things. The, the hackerspace movement began really began in, in Berlin, well, in, in Germany in 2007 when the Chaos Communication Camp uh, wrote a manual on how to create hackerspace. Uh, you wrote a manual how to create Hack Science Day, and the, the last Chaos Communication Camp two years ago said that the next program, the next project, would be to launch a hacker uh, in space or to launch satellites in order to avoid any kind of, uh, of censorship. Do, do, do you think that this hacker culture will is beginning to collaborate with uh, people like you or people who are working uh, at the NASA? Absolutely. I, I think uh, this collaboration between hackers and, and scientists and, and people at NASA is really fascinating. And I think the most important thing, though, is, is just these little communities that are developing. I think no longer is it about someone hacking on something in a basement all by themselves alone. Um, but actually hacking together with a larger community, you can accomplish quite a lot. So you're seeing this with space exploration. You're also seeing this with uh, the biotech industry. You have uh, biohacker spaces that are uh, popping up around the world. And I think by having people together in a community doing it and, and being able to pull in people from uh, different scientific industries to also help, uh, people are able to accomplish quite a bit um, and, and really make things accessible in a, in a way that we haven't seen for the last few decades. And have you seen children working in this space exploration with their teachers, with their uh, parents? Yeah, there's so many ways in which uh, kids can get involved in space exploration, which is just incredibly exciting. Um, there's great competitions like the Spirit of Innovation Awards, which um, tasks uh, students to uh, just make something inventive in space exploration. And this could be something from satellites to building habitats to um, building astronaut gloves, you know, whatever you want. Um, and there's so many competitions like that out there. Um, that are really getting kids involved in, in building things. Um, even smaller children, uh, projects like Galaxy Zoo, where you get to classify galaxies, are, are something that um, people at a fairly young age can participate in. And so it's just really great to see everyone being able to participate, no matter if they're five years old or you know 95 years old. And have you seen teachers trying to uh, help their uh, pupils uh, participate in Absolutely. schools? I, I think citizen science is becoming just this huge, you know, almost, uh, it's a bit of a buzzword, but you do see a lot of teachers realizing that in order to get their students to be more interested in science, having them actually contribute to something that furthers scientific discovery or, you know, in maybe sometimes even has their name published on a scientific paper actually is such an intrinsic reward as opposed to extrinsic. So I think a lot of teachers are getting involved in citizen science, um, realizing uh, different ways in which they can actually collaborate with NASA or collaborate with other scientific industries. It's really great. Uh, the, the, there are these uh, children who sent some teddy bears in space. Mm -hmm. uh, why why did, did they do this? It, it, uh, was it scientists? Uh, scientist, uh, a scientific uh, project? Yes, a scientific project, sorry. Uh, yeah, this was a, a really interesting project that happened, uh, uh, I guess, a few years ago. Um, you had kids um, from the UK, um, uh, they wanted to test how different materials react in high altitudes. And oh. so they actually put together this weather balloon and sent their teddy bears into near space. And so there's these great pictures of these teddy bears floating over the <laughs> earth uh, that you can see. Um, and I just think it's so awesome because you get to see different uh, students actually say, you know what, I don't, I don't know how to build a satellite and I don't know how to get a rocket launch, but you know, I want to test how different things react in, in high altitudes. And so I'm just going to send my teddy bear up there. Um, and, and you know, these were 11 to 13 year old kids. And uh, it, I don't know, it, these pictures are just amazing. They're really great. And um, I think it really speaks loudly to making space exploration more accessible, that it's something where even if you don't know how to do a lot of things, that doesn't mean you can't participate. 
Okay. There's also this brilliant video of this uh, father who launched a balloon with uh, uh, it, it was a small car uh, or another teddy bear of his son and everything has been videotaped. The balloon who is came in, uh, in the sky and the earth and after he went down. Yeah. Uh, th there's a question on Twitter. Uh, what do you think about um, the mining of asteroids by private societies? Yeah, mining asteroids is, is uh, definitely a new thing that's emerged over the last couple of years. I think uh, mining asteroids, it, so most effort seems to be uh, not using humans, so actually sending a, a robot up there and actually mining an asteroid that way. I think there's been a lot of debate about if the cost of building a spacecraft and la launching it into space um, and, and uh, bringing back materials, if that actually equalizes out the cost. Um, so a lot of people are very skeptical of, um, can we actually bring back enough resources to justify the cost of the rocket launch? Um, and that, that remains to be seen. I, I think the idea of mining asteroids, though, is, is an incredibly exciting thing, though, because I think for the first time, we're in a realistic way talking about terraforming or, or mining other resources uh, in, in our solar system. And that definitely marks a new beginning for us. I, I don't think that's really been uh, talked about in a realistic way until the last couple of years. So it's just another example of how, um, how our solar system, really from our perspective, is becoming more accessible for us to think about getting um, our resources, not only from Earth, but from different places, and, and our ability to really um, in some cases, explore the resources that we have available to us outside of Earth. Um, so I, I think it's it's really interesting to see, and there's a lot of other interesting ideas that haven't yet come to fruition um, that have been talked about in science fiction a lot. So being able to really better use the sun as a resource and, and capture the sun's energy so that we don't have to worry about energy here on Earth. Um, that's something that science fiction has often talked about, but there haven't been uh, realistic proposals to do so yet. So I think mining asteroids is just really one step along the way of us realizing how we can better use the solar system um, and how we can better uh, you know, terraform things uh, to our needs uh, if, if, uh, if we decide that's a good idea. <laughs> do you think it's possible to terraform Mars? Uh, I, think, I think it would be possible to terraform Mars. I, I think... Um, some interesting things I've looked at have been uh, people have realized that lichen, which is um, this uh, you know plant-like uh, material that helped really colonize the Earth uh, many years ago, uh, there are some pr forms of lichen that uh, people believe can actually survive on Mars. And so, if you're able to get these um, sort of resources on Earth that really helped colonize the Earth and take them to a different planet. Um, I don't know how long it would take, but you know, lichen is really great at breaking down their rock surfaces to give uh, to give uh, other life forms a foothold to grow. And so, um, I think I don't know. I, I think humans could figure out a way to terraform Mars. I, I don't think it's um, impossible. Uh, Stephen Hawking uh, said last week or two weeks ago that if humanity don't um, uh, leave the Earth. Um, it, it would be the end of humanity. What, what do you think about that in, in, in a thousand of years? I think that's a, an interesting perspective. And I, I think, you know, watching the conversation be, between Stephen Hawking and other people who disagree with him is, is really fascinating. Um, I, I think there are a lot of questions that people have about if we're supposed to become a, a, a space-faring civilization or not. Um, and I think Stephen Hawking, you know, he's, uh, he has some very interesting perspectives that um, I think are worth listening to um, and, and really contemplating. Um, and I think, you know, you're seeing a lot of people conversing around uh, if we should become a space-faring society or not. And that seems to be um, a, a conversation that um, tends to be ongoing with people. Um, and, yeah, it's... it's, it's it's interesting. <laughs> uh, you're you're uh, associated with SETI. Uh, uh, I I saw this. Uh, what what are you, um, what do you do for SETI exactly? So I'm 
Uh, I'm an, just an advisor for uh, the SETI Institute's radio program, which is okay. called Big Picture Science. Um, and Big Picture Science is just this really great uh, podcast uh, between Seth Shawstak, who is a senior astronomer at SETI, um, and Molly. And uh, essentially, they get together and they talk about different uh, interesting science subjects. And it really ranges from everything from talking about insects to talking about um, yeah, finding extraterrestrial life. And uh, so it's just a really great program, and, and so I just help um, advise them and, and um, you know, help out where I can. Do you think we are alone in the new universe or not? <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I, would, I, I tend to go on the side of thinking that there has to be life somewhere else in the universe, but I'm not really sure what form it takes. Um, I, I do think um, it would be the weirdest scientific discovery uh, ever if we if we found out that there that we are the only life in the universe um, that would be so scientifically surprising um, that it would really it would really confuse us for a long time to come. <laughs> um, so so I, I do think there's um, other uh, alien civilizations out there. I just um, am unsure about the level of intelligence and, and the ability to actually communicate across so many, you know, millions and, and millions and billions of light years. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's not surprising that we haven't found a signal yet, but I, I do think there's something out there. So you hope, you hope a signal or something? Uh, I hope, yeah, I hope that we would find a signal, but I, I think, um, I think there's so many ways in which we can be looking for signals and we're just really at the beginning of it. So. Traditionally, SETI has looked at radio waves as, as a way of detecting if, if um, a, a civilization might be broadcasting via radio. Um, but I think it's also interesting to think about um, optical SETI. So there's uh, efforts to actually look into the universe for pulses of light that could only be generated by intelligent civilizations. So there's a lot of different ways we could be searching, and we've really only just not even scratch the surface of, of what we could be doing. So I think hopefully hopefully there'll be more funding for efforts like SETI um, so that we can really uh, try and look in, in all these different spectrums and, and, and um, uh, do a better job of, of figuring out <laughs> if there's uh, life elsewhere in the universe. Thanks. Uh, so, so last year and this year, several uh, uh, hundreds and several thousands of projects uh, have been proposed to the Space Apps uh, NASA Challenge. Um, ha have you seen some of those projects that really help uh, space exploration? Or um, so I'm not as familiar with this year's uh, projects uh, because yeah, I'm it was last week. Traveling. Uh, yeah, it was just last week. Uh, last year, though, I participated um, in the Space Ops Challenge in uh, Kenya, and so it was uh, really interesting to see what people were working on there. Um, in, in Nairobi, they were working on a lot of robotics, um, a lot of improving different robotic al algorithms, and they were also working on um, projects that better, better analyzed farmland, uh, which actually you're seeing more people interested in in Africa. You, you have different um, uh, African satellites that are actually analyzing farmland and, and being able to make uh, more accurate predictions about uh, farms and uh, just give better information. So I believe Nigeria has a, a couple of satellites um, in orbit that are really paying attention to this. And so I think that's what's kind of interesting. and. Um, exciting about the Space Apps Challenge is <clears throat> you're actually seeing uh, people from around the world um, really work on things that are interesting for where they are um, and for their community. And so in Africa, I think there's a lot of concern about um, uh, land and, and how to uh, analyze it and, and how to best use it. And so I think um, in, in Africa, the, the things people have been working on there have been uh, about getting satellites to have better pictures of the Earth. And so absolutely, this really speaks to how the Space Apps Challenge is, is really changing um, how people participate in space exploration because things that might otherwise not interest a certain country or yeah. a certain uh, city interest other cities. And so maybe those areas of science would otherwise get overlooked. But by having so many people participate in it, you're really opening up space exploration to doing a lot of 
work that might otherwise get overlooked by NASA or, or other government agencies um, that are actually really fundamentally important to different parts of the world. And do, do you have now example of this disruptive uh, technologies or disruptive projects or ideas that have been found by people uh, who are not scientists and not officially involved in space exploration? Yeah, to me, uh, disruptive projects are not only things that are lowering the cost, but they're also uh, looking at sort of the, the fringes of science. So the story I, I mentioned earlier about the particle physicist having a new way to detect cosmic rays, um, that's an example of something that might not come about unless you had a collision between different types of people. Um, and you're also seeing in all different sciences, just people exploring the fringes of science or, or science that has been underrepresented uh, or underfunded um, or is considered a bit risky. Um, you're, you're seeing people actually really open it up in a disruptive way. So I think it's, it's quite, uh, quite interesting to look at all of these different ways in which people are opening up space exploration. Um, not just doing the same thing for cheaper, but doing it differently. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, people in Berlin and different hacker spaces are, are really thinking about this, um, about how there are different ways to do things and how you could use satellites for different, uh, different ideas that people haven't used until before. Uh, I often hear that uh, space exploration is expensive and use, useless. Uh, do, do, do you have examples of... Uh, how a space industry uh, can help everyday everyday's life, like satellites for the, the farming, uh, so or yeah. So it's actually really interesting to look at what NASA has been able to accomplish over the last uh, few decades. Um, so many items that everyone has in their house uh, have actually they got their start by um, NASA sort of creating new technologies, um, and so I think get having people, more people involved in space exploration and really pushing space exploration further, oftentimes you see new technologies being developed that, um, that either further science or they kind of help you at home. And so uh, you do see um, things like, uh, I believe, like the UV coating on sunglasses came out of uh, NASA um, and a lot of different household items. Um, sometimes, sometimes you're seeing uh, different different technologies help yeah, farmers or um, people able to better predict things. I, I think a lot of times we also forget how much we're tied to space exploration. Our, our weather forecasts, our um, GPS locations, um, all of these things are actually made possible through space exploration. So it very much affects our everyday life. And, and so I think that's kind of one of the, the tragedies of space exploration over the last few decades is we've really um, forgotten or, or taken for granted how much we use space exploration every day, um, whether or not we're interested in it, and how much uh, we are pretty much dependent on it uh, in a lot of ways um, when it comes to satellites and uh, the different technologies we have available to us. Hmm. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you. I have no more questions. Wow. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Yeah, it was great. Thank you so and much. And she, she told us that she will organize yes. the Science Hack Day in Paris. I will, I will. <laughs> I will. We'll keep in touch. Thank you. Yes. Thank you Bye. very much. Have a nice day. Bye.